I'll be talking about my work towards verified compilation of KML into WebAssembly. So who of you, raise hands, um, has heard of WebAssembly before? Okay, that's very good. Um, uh, so this is basically the only connection that I will have to JavaScript. Uh, so please, uh, please bear with me. Um, so WebAssembly is currently mostly being hosted in, in browsers, in browser runtimes uh, inside of JavaScript. So that's the connection that I have. Um, aside from that, we will be talking about KML, which is a functional programming language that I will introduce. Um, and it will be about uh, software verification. But first, let me tell you how this all happened. Uh, it was already introduced as a more academic talk and it kind of is. Um, so I'm currently studying uh, computational logic, which is the theoretical and dry part of computer science uh, and a lot of mathematics, but I really like it. And this is a program uh, being held at TU Dresden, uh, Freie Universität Bozen and TU Wien. And in the summer, I got the chance to go to Australia where I've been working on KML, and this was an awesome experience, and now I'm here to talk about it. So first of all, I'll, I'll have a, a sort of prelude to what I'm going to be talking. Um, I will have to introduce software verification a bit because this is not what we commonly use in the workplace. And then I will introduce briefly WebAssembly KML, and then what it means to translate KML to WebAssembly some words about verification and then where my work actually is currently and how it will continue. So the motivation for uh, software verification, I guess you all know that software has bugs and in some cases bugs mean uh, injury and death to people. And this is something that's really critical. We're talking about critical infrastructure. Maybe this is not the case for your particular project, um, but just look at the development of integrating, uh, integrating software systems into critical infrastructure and digitization. So this is, this is the topic that uh, I'm picking up here. Um, critical infrastructure might not be what you think about it, like power plants, but some people even consider TLS implementations or operating systems as critical infrastructure. Because just think about, um, I don't know, weapon systems or airplanes, they also run operating systems and they have to communicate securely. And if something goes wrong there, then it can go really wrong, as I said before. Um, so that's the, the frame we're operating in and there are many uh, possible ways um, to achieve that. The underlying question that you probably are also asking yourself, even if you're not into software verification is, does my code do what it should? And that of course varies project by project. Um, so it could be that your, that your code has to be free of security vulnerabilities. Maybe it is a concurrent program and it should be deadlock free. Um, maybe it has to fulfill a certain specification, maybe from a customer. Um, and then also the question of whether all resources that need to be accessed can actually be at some point accessed. So no, no particular worker in your system starves. These are all properties that are quite tricky to actually have in a program. And there are many ways to get to this point and verifying those. You probably know about unit testing. So um, commonly you would test your code and verify that certain runs through your code are actually doing what they should do. So you have uh, one, so let's say for one unit test, you have one run through your code usually. And you can then test whether the result is actually correct. But there's a slight problem because um, if you just look at uh, the domain of strings, for example, there are infinitely many strings. So you will just never be able to get uh, to a certainty that your code is actually correct, given the input uh, being infinite. So there are other approaches, um, other testing approaches that have similar flaws. So even if you do bigger tests, you will run into more complicated scenarios, but they kind of fall in a very, very similar category. And then if you um, want to do formal proof, which is what I'm going to talk about, this is also like unit tests to ensure that uh, some program satisfies a property. But in this case, it's about a formal proof. So you don't just get like a, a green icon in your IDE because some specific execution through your program worked, but you actually in the end have a formal proof that any execution of your program behaves as specified, which is a fun fundamentally different thing. And it allows you to 
ask new questions about your program. You can, for example, do equivalence between programs and so on and so forth, which you cannot easily do by unit testing. Or in most cases, you cannot even do that. So is that a business? Um, yes, it is, but it's not as, as, I don't know, not as mainstream as you would think. So there are companies that do mostly static analysis. And of course, the big players have, have uh, dedicated teams working on that. They develop static analyzers and compilers. <laughs> and the way this field started is actually through chip manufacturers, because you can see a CPU or a chip also as something that executes a specification. But in the case of chip development, it's actually really hard to have this iterative debugging uh, process going. So if you have your IDE and you have a debugger and you step through and something goes wrong, that's not something you can do when you're designing a CPU. So um, you, you have to, you're more forced into this area of formal verification where you have to actually make sure that it works and then you can produce your chip and then you can run it, but you cannot iterate as quickly um, as with just pure software. And what I'll be talking is a verified, what I'll be talking about is a verified compiler and they are slowly uh, getting more and more advanced. Uh, but, and I will mention why verified compilers are actually important. Um, and this is, can be described here sort of. So uh, this is the actual system, a KKML that I will be talking about. So to the left you have, and this is called a front end. So this is not a web front end, but it's a compiler front end. So on the left you have a KKML program which in the end has to be translated into a WebAssembly module. And this is a compiler implemented in higher order logic. This is the system, the, the KML compiler. And so it really doesn't matter which language is here or which language is here. Um, if you have a formal language on the left side, like your input language, and you prove some very nice properties um, about your program, for example, that it fulfills a certain specification, and you're like, yeah, happy, uh, everything works. I have a formal proof that everything is correct. But then somehow you have to run it. And usually when you want to run a program, oftentimes you have to compile it. Um, yeah, so what about your proofs that you just did? I mean, this is not the same program, right? You're, you're putting it through this compiler. So what actually happens? I mean, if the compiler itself, which does this translation, is not verified, then what are your proofs worth? They are worth nothing. So you actually have to look into verified compilers too. And they are a crucial part of bootstrapping this whole ecosystem. So if you don't have a verified compiler, you cannot ever really be um, serious about running your program that you have verified properties about. Are there any questions about this graph? You should, you should, you should get this before we go on. So we have an we have a compiler that's set up like this and it runs in SML and through a theorem prover called Hall. Okay, so I assume that that's fine. And we'll just now introduce WebAssembly briefly. Um, for most of you, my guess is that you have heard about WebAssembly um, by compiling to it. So you were just using another language like Rust or C++, MScript, and you name it, compile to WebAssembly, but you didn't really think about the details of WebAssembly or the syntax of WebAssembly, for example. But I actually had to do that. So I want to share the knowledge about what happens when you read the WebAssembly course back and think about it. Um, but let's start easy. Um, this is what you should be familiar with. So the yellow part is your JavaScript. And the violet part in there is your embedded WebAssembly. And what WebAssembly is commonly used for is that, okay, you have some modules in there, you have host functions that can communicate to the outside world. This is JavaScript. And then you can, through this, there are some host bindings or some, some certain bindings to pass data back and forth. But in the end, you have this uh, nice sandbox inside your JavaScript that can talk to the outside world. By design, this outside box cannot just be JavaScript. It can basically be any, any runtime and there are multiple other runtimes out there. But of course, browsers and JavaScript are by far the most common ones. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel very free to interrupt me. Um, otherwise, I'll just continue. So WebAssembly is a portable code format, first of all. So um, it's not just, uh, binaries or some 
ISA, I mean, it's an ISA 2, but it aims to be this kind of portable code format like we have seen this for uh, Java bytecode, for example, or LLVM intermediate code and so on. Sandbox by design, as I said, it's openly developed and that's an effort It is actually supported by major browser vendors. In order to be supported by major browser vendors, people had to actually, you know, get rid of Pinnacle and SMJS, but it all worked out and now we have WebAssembly and it's quite fast. Uh, that's because WebAssembly is quite low level and cheating it to actual machine code is really easy. And one goal is to open up the browser for other languages. Those of you who have compiled from C++ or Rust already know that. So taking this from, the, from a presentation of the actual spec author, um, you can see that um, it's not, so there's some, there some differences to other code that runs in the browser. So we can compare this to JavaScript. Um, for example, one thing that I like to highlight is that it's streamable. What does that mean? Um, it's streamable in the sense that you can actually start kind of parsing and verifying the WebAssembly module as you read it in through the network. So you don't have to, with, as with JavaScript, you have to read a complete file, parse the file, and only then, it, so only if you have the complete file, you can parse it. And that actually kind of takes some time when you load a website. That's something you don't have with WebAssembly. It was designed to be kind of streamed into, into the browser while verifying it. And as soon as it's there and verified, you can, you can just run it. So it's faster to, to load. And then for me as a kind of theory person, it's very cool that the semantics of WebAssembly aim to be very deterministic. So in, in the actual specification, there are no cases where, where it's like, ah, this might happen or that might happen or maybe something else might happen. So the, the spec is very deterministic and that, that is a nice property for proving stuff about it because you don't have so many different cases in your proofs. And it should be easy to reason about. Yeah, the type system is quite simple and I guess hardware independence is quite obvious. But yeah, that's, that's the picture. So how does it look? Um, on the left, you have a program in an S expression syntax. If you have ever seen Lisp, um, this is kind of like Lisp. If you have never seen Lisp, please look at Lisp. <laughs> and so, so this is really kind of just the, the abstract syntax as a tree. And you can just read this in as a tree. And on, on the bottom, you have the same program in a different syntax. So WebAssembly actually defines an abstract syntax, and then it defines multiple concrete syntaxes that directly map one-to-one -to, -one to the abstract syntax. So we have the same program in two different syntaxes. They are on the abstract syntax, undistinguishable. Yeah, and then of course you can also use the postfix notation, and the, uh, which is just the, the postfix traversal of, so these are two different programs, right? So the left one is something that computes addition of two numbers, and the right one is something that computes, computes the factorial of two numbers or the factorial of one number, sorry. And the, the right one is just the, the postfix notation, which gives you this streaming property. So if you look at the left one, you actually have to somehow reshuffle uh, in order to get a streamed, a streamable program. The right one is streamed or is streamable and they are both this valid in, in the same way. So this is, they are both valid uh, WebAssembly programs. Okay. so. The abstract syntax, what do we have? We have numerics, um, so basic uh, constants, numbers, unary, binary operations. Um, then you have variables, so you have a local scope and a global scope. The local scope is local to the function being executed, and the global scope is, of course, global. Then you have some memory access, and you have local control flow, so you can have an, an if loop blocks, and you can, uh, well, call is not local, but the others are local, and a few others. And yeah, you can declare uh, function tables to do indirect dispatching of functions and you can export and import stuff. It's fairly basic. I'm more interested in the semantics uh, because I have to prove uh, stuff about these programs. So there's a type system, which is very simple. And the, cement the semantics of WebAssembly is actually given as a, a relational small step reduction. What does that mean? I will show you in a second. And we can 
we can actually prove nice properties about these programs, which is not the case with many other programming languages that are specified in natural language or yeah, even, even not really specified at all. So you don't have to read this. This is just to show you the, the abstract syntax. And this is this uh, reduction rule. So you don't have to look at the concrete thing, what happens here. But this is the semantics of the language, and it's really simple. It just tells you if you have an expression that looks like this thing on the left, so it's kind of like pattern match. You can just look at it, and if, yeah, it looks like that. Then you can actually, there's, there's a little arrow here. It just tells you, okay, what comes out is the thing on the right. And if you just apply these, um, these arrow, this arrow relation, which is called the small step semantics, if you just apply that over and over and over again, again then you just get the result of the program. And this is really what's happening inside your head if you're thinking about, okay, this, I don't know, you have an if here, and then you have some two sub-expressions, and then you kind of evaluate the if in your head, then you will make the very same substitution um, in, in your own head. But the difference is that this is formalized, right? So this is mathematical notation, and it's clearly defined what it means. So it's not in someone's head or in some spec editor's words or something. It's in formal language, and that's very important. Then you have a type system on top, which just tell you um, uh, if something has a t if some expression has a specific type, and then you look at a sub-expression, then the sub-expression must have uh, another type. And and by doing that, you can actually, um, yeah, in in a very similar way, you can assemble the typing structure of your whole program. These are more or less all the rules. So. You haven't, you haven't seen them in detail, um, but you have seen all of them. And if you just look at them in detail, then you will see, okay, it's actually not so complicated. There's like, I don't know, 50 of them, and they are understandable. And if you have understood them, you've basically understood formal semantics of a programming language, which is pretty awesome. Um, what this gives you is that you can now prove properties about WebAssembly. So, you can say, for example, that if some configuration, so S and T, um, uh, so, so this, this turnstile here means that some configuration has a valid type T, and then this arrow here is you know, what happens when you execute it. So you have something to the left gets executed, and whatever comes out is the thing on the right. Okay? So if you execute something, then the result of the execution, so S prime T prime, this is the new configuration, um, still has the same type. That's, I mean, that's totally trivial. If you have, I don't know, some expression, you add two integers, you expect that what comes out should be an integer, right? So this is more or less what we are saying here. And there's another side condition on S. S contains all the state of the program, more or less. So it contains the memory, it contains variables, and so on. And this, uh, this, uh, this uh, partial order there just tells you, okay, everything is just behaving in, in a good way. And if you look at the second uh, theorem, this is the pro progress theorem, then this just means that either some configuration has reached end of the execution. What does that mean? End of execution means it's a value. You cannot, if you have a value like a number or a string, there's nothing to execute anymore. If you have an addition, sure, then you have, to, you have to do something you can execute. But if you have reached a value, then you're kind of at the end. So this is what's called terminal. Of course, there are cases like exceptions and traps, but they are kind of straightforward to extend to. And so this means that um, either it's terminal or you will actually find in this crazy table here, you will actually find an arrow that you can apply. So it tells you either you have stopped or there is an error, that, an, an error that matches. So that's nice because that means that a program is either done executing or it can execute further. That's actually not trivial to prove. And then to get... It means that there are no infinite loops in that, right? No, that doesn't mean there are no infinite loops because if you continually apply the reduction rule, you might still be in an infinite loop. Okay. Um, and together we have a soundness theorem. So what it actually means is that there are only nice memory accesses and the, the program does what it's supposed to do. And yeah, so this is something that you cannot prove about many other programming languages. So um, if you would 
just try to attempt to do this for TypeScript, you would have no chance. Um, yes? But here it says um, it takes a finite number of steps to read a thermal configuration. Yeah, but the other case is it diverges, and diverges means the same as running infinitely. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so this is something that you cannot do with every language. So WebAssembly was my idea to compile to WebAssembly and to actually verify compilation to WebAssembly is that it's so cool that it has a formal semantics because you don't just find so many programming languages that actually have a formal meaning to them. They just, well, they kind of work and someone has written a compiler or an interpreter which works, but there's no formal specification for many, for many languages. Um, okay, I, I will skip the part of maturity and adoption. I kind of think that most of you know where WebAssembly is right now and what people are working on or using it for. If you have any questions about that, please ask. Um, but I would like to say what might be the future of WebAssembly. So WebAssembly uh, was released as an MVP. So it, when it was released, the, the first version is very small and it just, it can compute basically. It has this type system that I showed and the reduction that I showed and a very clear semantics. But there's other stuff that people want. For example, garbage collection would be nice uh, because if you want to pass references to the JavaScript space, then what about references? I mean, what's the lifetime of a reference that is that was passed to JavaScript? Who knows? So you need a concept of, of uh, garbage collection there if you want to do that. Uh, concurrency would be cool. Uh, exception handling is also something that many people want and something that would be very dear to my heart is actually implementing tail calls um, because I'm the compiler I've written compiles from a functional programming language and tail calls are actually necessary to not blow up the, the call stack and just uh, yeah just reach an uh, stacks uh, out of stack space exception more or less mm. Yeah, and these will, as a JavaScript developer, these might not affect you directly, but this will definitely affect the compilers that compile to WebAssembly. And maybe it will make interfacing with WebAssembly much nicer, especially once garbage collection is in there, it will get much cooler to interface with JavaScript because this is the, the basic requirement for actually talking to the DOM or something like that out of uh, WebAssembly. Okay, first part. Um, so now I'm going to briefly introduce KML, which comes from like a completely different angle, um, but I'll try to make them fit together. So um, KML is a functional programming language and it's, a, it's part of a bigger project. So it's about rigorous engineering of mainstream systems. That's what REMS stands for. And you can see that this is structured in somehow in layers and people are thinking of, okay, how can we actually do um, verif software verification in a like holistic perspective? How can we take all the, all the science that's going on and all the prototypes that have been done, how can we integrate them to reach from verified hardware up to verified applications? And um, KML is somewhere in the middle because in order to do that, you need a programming language that is not assembler. Um, so you need a compiler in between and you need a, you need a nice programming language to, to work in. So if any of you know standard ML or OCaml or maybe Haskell, uh, this, is, this is the kind of uh, area that we're moving in with KML. It's a subset of standard ML. And well, this is something that could be used to implement um, in the end applications. So there are actually some applications, very, very small ones, but there are some application implementations um, in, in KML. But this is, this is all being worked on and REMS is not just some fancy startup, it's a research project. So this will take some time. Um, okay, so what is it actually? Um, it's the first, to my knowledge and to the knowledge of the program, of, of the project team, compi verified compiler of a functional programming language. And it was kind of released, you could say, by publishing it in 2014. And it's quite a big team. So there are 16 core contributors and 25, let's say, related contributors. The, it's often said that the CA in Cake comes from Cambridge and the KE comes from Kent. 
Uh, but since then, there's other people working on it. So um, a University of Chalmers down there on the left, and then Data61, which is where I have worked. So this is a, a very global effort. So on that slide, we have the UK, we have Sweden, Australia. And I guess if you want to join, then it's not a problem. So it's, it's kind of a globally distributed project and a very, very fun to work with all these people. Mm. It's a substantial subset of standard ML. That means it's basically standard ML reduced, but you can still do interesting stuff with it. So what's missing is modules and functors between modules. Um, but this is like the biggest restriction. There are some other small restrictions, but it has everything that you want, that you would expect from a programming language. And there are two front ends, again, compiler front ends. So the first, so this is, the front end is concerned with the parser and how you get code into the compiler, right? So the first way is that you actually translate from Hall, which is a logic, high order logic. Um, so this is just formulas and formal statements. You translate them into KML abstract syntax. This translation is also verified. Um, and then you feed this into the compiler. This is actually the way that um, KML can compile itself, but that's a different story, I guess. And if you want to parse KML concrete syntax, so just a file, then this also works. So these are the two front ends. And then there are optimizing backends. You, you can target x86, ARM, RISC, MIPS, and the work I'm doing is to extend this optimizing backend for, for uh, WebAssembly. So this is how, how they will fit. And yeah, it can bootstrap itself um, via frontend one. I already mentioned that. And what's cool is it allows, it has, a, it has an FFI. So you can kind of say there are other functions outside of WebAssembly. And that really nicely maps to host functions. Uh, so outside of KML. And the, this really maps nicely to host functions in WebAssembly. So that's it as a picture. So this is the, the standard way from an ASCII file to actually should be a UTF-8 file. Um, you, can, you can somehow hook this up, the full, the full blown chain here down to machine code, or you can do the proof producing synthesis using whole functions to machine code um, or characteristic formulas, but they are complicated in another, another topic. So how does the compiler look? Well, um, it has, some input and it has to generate some output and in between there's just many 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 layers um, the actual the actual boxes here are different intermediate languages so the first intermediate language is the source syntax it's kml and the last ones down here this is arm assembler x86 assembler and so on and in between you can just imagine that this is a very abstract language this is like functional programming right so nothing near an assembler and down there you have to be at an assembler for it to make sense. So what you're doing at every one of these arrows is you ever so slightly remove the, you remove the abstractions. So you're just craving through your program, removing abstractions until you're actually down to machine code. And a big part of my, of my work was actually figuring this out. Like imagine you're joining a project like this and someone says, yeah, Compile to WebAssembly, please. Uh, it's kind of crazy. So you have to find you have to find the right part in the compiler where is actually the best the best spot to say ah and now let's go for WebAssembly. So how did that work? Um, you look at the whole thing again and you look for an intermediate language inside the compiler that matches WebAssembly as closely as possible. So WebAssembly operates on words, which I immediately directs your attention to this part of the compiler. Because um, above you have, so in, in, the, in, in the above, let's say third, in the first third, you have abstract values and really no concept of a pointer or something. And then on the, on the, middle, on the middle third, you have something like pointers and values. And on the lower third, there's no distinction anymore between a pointer and a value. So that's where we want to be. So we focus in on that. Uh, then you actually have to manage memory because we said garbage collection is this feature that they want to do in the future, but it's not there yet. So you have to do it yourself. Um, that's nice because we have here one phase that actually says implement GC primitive. So before that, there's a GC, so something that relies on uh, just tracking, tracking references, um, freeing memory, allocating memory, and so on. And 
so in the compiler, there's actually a GC implementation that somehow gets placed into the program. So we want to be after that. Then there's local control flow. So we want to be before the code gets flattened. Flattened means that um, all the local control flow, like an if or a while or something that groups stuff together is more or less replaced with something like jumps and uh, comparisons and jumps and so on. And then in WebAssembly, there are no, so this is quite specific to the compiler. There's one stage that actually ensures the register naming, uh, that the register naming corresponds to the actual architecture. There's no such thing in WebAssembly, so you can just skip it. And the WebAssembly stack is implicit. You cannot refer to something else in the stack. Um, maybe I should mention WebAssembly is formalized as a stack machine. So there's the concept of a stack where you can add values and then you operate on the top of the stack and something, something happens on top of the stack. Um, but you cannot address lower parts of the stack. You cannot have an instruction on the top that says, ah, what, what is 100, uh, 100 slots down the stack? You cannot do that. So you have to be below um, this uh, translation of the stack. Okay, um, the challenges in there are actually um, the mismatches between this, this language that I chose here to the left, it's uh, stack lang uh, and WebAssembly itself. So there's no exception handling in WebAssembly and no tail recursive calls in WebAssembly. And this makes this stuff really hard because now you have two languages that, are, that actually don't really match up with each other. And in order to prove anything significant about WebAssembly, you also need a semantics that matches up with the semantics of StackLang, which is this intermediate language inside KML. So I had to do that as well. So how it looks like is the, the top part is everything that's concerned with WebAssembly and the lower part is everything that's concerned with StackLang. And in the end, you have a program going in uh, through your translation stack to WASM and a program going out. And in between you have, so this is the implementation of the compiler. And then you have a proof of correctness for your compiler, which has to talk about the semantics of KML and the semantics of WebAssembly. Um, yeah, so how do you verify this? Um, it's like a simulation proof. So um, again, what's orange uh, is like corresponds to the front end of the compiler. So this is stack length. And what's uh, blue corresponds to WebAssembly. So what you have is this, uh, this magic kind of commuting diagram, not really a commuting diagram, I know, but something similar. And you basically have to show that if you have a program one, which you compile to program two, and you execute or evaluate those two programs, so you, you evaluate them, then um, still there is some kind of similarity between the uh, result. So R means result, S means state. Um, and, and this similarity is preserved. So if, it, if S1 and S2, the initial states are similar, and then you execute your programs, then the resulting states are also similar. If you can achieve that, then you have what you would call a correctness proof for the translation. And the schematic of the proof is like this. So um, you have like here a, a, a universal quantification. So you can prove this for every program and for every state. So it's an in inductive proof over the structure of the program. And what you can actually then derive is that you will always find this uh, lower part of the of this construction. Do you have any questions about that? Should I explain it in more detail? I'm running out of time. So if there is any question about that. OK. Uh, so the, the progress is that the static and dynamic semantics of WebAssembly have been mechanized. So this means I sat down and I wrote a formal version of the WebAssembly spec in higher order logic. That's not something you get for free. And um, the initialization semantics of WebAssembly are mostly formalized. So this is what happens when you actually instantiate a module. And I also have this alternative version of a semantics in a uh, big step style because the semantics given in the spec are small step. And the, the translation is prototyped and it was actually also quite tricky to integrate all of this in the existing compiler. And 
yeah, the proof is not actually done yet. There are many, many lemmas that I proved, but like this full picture here is just a conjecture right now. And it will, of course, work out, but it's actually tough to prove this, even if it might look simple. And yeah, so what is to be done? Um, proving compiler correctness, which is just this uh, picture that I showed, and actually also proving that everything that the compiler produces will be valid WebAssembly, which is, yeah, right now it's like an assumption, but probably I can discharge that. Okay, so quick recap. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. You're also very welcome to mail to me if you need any information about this project, how to contribute or anything, I'm very happy to help you. Thanks. <laughs>